Okay, um, good morning, everyone. My name is Katrin Radke, and I'm working at the Ruhr University Bochum's Institute for Law of Peace and Armed Conflict. Our cluster, Violent Disruptions and Forced Migration, welcomes you today to our second panel discussion in the online event series on anticipating climate change and disaster displacement. Today, our topic is anticipating climate-induced displacement trends and prediction models. As you certainly know, our institute has a strong focus on humanitarian action. Since nearly 30 years, we offer the so-called NOHA master's program in international humanitarian action. Last year, we co-founded the Academy for Humanitarian Action, which offers executive education for humanitarians. Our research includes, among others, a large project on inclusive humanitarian action, the practices of violence project, numerous PhD projects on forced displacement and humanitarian action, for example, on non-state armed actors and humanitarian organizations, on humanitarian standards, norm implementation, localization, use of mobile technology, to name but a few. Furthermore, our institute took over responsibility to calculate and further develop the World Risk Index, which indicates the disaster risk of 181 countries in the world. It is this combination of topics and expertise, as well as important developments with respect to data availability, mainly due to the use of satellite imagery that triggered our interest in the anticipation of climate-induced displacement and the wish to make a difference and contribute to the development of a new branch of humanitarian action, namely anticipatory humanitarian action. <clears throat> According to the Nansen Initiative, displacement due to disasters, including the adverse effects of climate change, is among the biggest humanitarian challenges in the 21st century. Already today, millions of people are displaced by weather and climate related hazards. The number of people displaced could be reduced by tens of millions as a result of global action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and with investments in far-sighted development planning, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation. However, many of the global legal and policy frameworks, such as the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, the Agenda for Humanity, the UNFCCC, and the Global Compact on Refugees, emphasize also the role um, and importance of humanitarian action in the context of climate-induced disaster displacement, whenever displacement cannot be prevented. For all approaches addressing climate-induced displacement, the availability of trends and prediction models and reliable data is an important prerequisite. At the center of today's panel discussion are therefore the following questions. What predictive models on climate-induced migration exist? What do they tell us about the extent and nature of climate-induced migration? How reliable are they? And how can they be linked to humanitarian practice? I am very happy to introduce to you our distinguished panel. All our panelists have worked on scenarios, trends, or prediction models of displacement, sometimes also climate-induced displacement, taking into account longer-term trends and or short-term um, perspectives. Please welcome with me Kanta Kumari Rigo. She is a lead environmental specialist and regional climate change coordinator in the Africa region of the World Bank Group. Kanta led a multidisciplinary team on the bank's 
pioneering flagship report on Groundswell Preparing for International Climate Migration. Diana Sulaimanova, she is a re research fellow in multi-scale migration prediction at the Department of Computer Science at Brunel University, London. She has worked extensively on predicting forced displacement using a generalized and automated agent-based simulation and has published on the topic of climate refugees. Diana will be supported in the discussion by Derek Grün and Ali Riza Johani. Pablo Fernandez, he is a research associate at the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center. His work focuses on internal displacement associated with slow onset environmental change and disasters. I am happy to mention that Pablo holds a master's degree in international humanitarian action, um, NOHA. Alexander Kierum is a global advisor and senior analyst with the Danish Refugee Council. He is supporting the organization with making better and smarter use of data and analysis for strategic planning, programming, and advocacy. This includes exploring the potential of using predictive anal analytics and big data to improve humanitarian protection outcomes, and he's leading the flagship foresight project. Before I give the floor to the speakers now, I would like to mention that we would like to keep this webinar interactive. You may post questions and comments in the Zoom chat window already during the presentations. My colleague, Daniel Weller, who is with us in the room, will collect the question and post them to the panelists. And now, without further ado, I would like to hand over, and um, we didn't agree um, on an order, but I um, would like to give the word to Kanta Kumari Rigo. Um, and um, yeah, um, I think she will um, share a presentation. And then please, Kanta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Catherine, for, for the welcome and uh, for the introduction. Sharing my slides. Can you see the slides? Can you see the slides? We can see the slides, but we cannot hear you very well. Can you hear me better? Yes, absolutely. Great. Thank you very much uh, for, for the introduction uh, to your own work and um, to to the session and to the panelists. Um, I'm, it's a real pleasure to join all of you on this really important conversation and uh, to looking forward and the anticipation, not that we are anticipating this event, but how we can plan, better plan and, and manage these is issues. What I'll do today is to share with you, uh, as you've mentioned, in 2018, the World Bank put out a flagship report working together with leading researchers uh, from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Change, with the CSIN Earth Center in Columbia University, as well as the CUNY Institute of Demographic Research. And that report essentially sought to understand what would be the potency of climate, particularly in the context of slow onset climate practice to drive migration within countries in the future. And the second part of this is really then to better inform policymakers and uh, you know, communities of practice like yourself, the human humanitarian, the development, the disaster risk communities on the potential scale of the issue to spur early action and far-sighted planning. This was done in the context of the World Bank being a development institution and recognizing that there was an increasing number of displacements that were happening as a consequence of multiple forces, including disasters and climate change. So what we undertook was a study to understand the scale of the issue, the patterns and the trends in the longer term context. What did we do with the research uh, team? The overall synopsis of the model is that we used a population gravity model 
a gravity model works by by ways of attraction and repellence of, 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 of issues. Uh, but we use that to isolate the portion of future changes in the population distribution that could be attributed to slow onset climate factors. And I'll come back to the factors we looked at, which was water stress, uh, drops in crop productivity and sea level rise. And what we did, we used a plausible scenario based approach to characterize what would be the scale, the magnitude of it, as well as the spread in terms of geography uh, using what we call the emission pathways, the regional concentration pathways that are used in IC IPCC uh, for high and low emissions. And we use a couple of what we call the shared socioeconomic pathways, which characterize development pathways. And here we use two pathways, the sort of unequal development pathway, where there is high population, high urbanization, low education, low possibility to adapt, as well as the moderate development pathways when things are more moderated. Um, and to that, what we did, which is probably different from most other studies, is that we did not use straightforward climate factors of precipitation and temperature, but rather we use crop uh, and water simulations as were done by this Izimib project, uh, which really then is also a little bit geospatial. Using this state-of-art computer simulations as inputs into the model, and we use them because they are actually directly relevant to the livelihood outcomes of people who are engaged in sectors that are particularly climate sensitive. To the, to the model, we added the sea level rise, which was not modeled in because see, we use it as a mask. As a mask, meaning that when you have areas of habitability that will be reduced as a consequence of sea level, but we compounded it with storm surge because it's the surges that probably that do make those areas uh, un uninhabitable or where one loses their livelihood uh, opportunities. Um, we recognize that of course there are sources of uncertainty and we have assumptions in the model which we have spelled out quite trans transparently in the document. But at the same time, even though we are using this model which is high level and top down, we contextualize the results against current and historic mobility in the areas and in the localities, peer reviewed literature, and we did some local consultations. So this is really to provide you the context of the original groundswell approach. And these are the three scenarios that we look at. We start off with what we call the pessimistic or the reference scenario, which is a combination of the high emission pathways a business as usual if we do not take strong mitigation measures and combine that with the SSP4, which is the unequal development pathway. From that scenario, we looked at two alternative scenarios. One is what we call the more inclusive development scenario, uh, where you have better development considerations and pathways, but continued high emissions. Uh, the alternate is where we go from the pessimistic to look at the more climate friendly, which is where we have uh, reduce emissions in the likes of the Paris Agreement, uh, but continued high um, and unequitable development. We start off the modeling by looking at what we call a 14 kilometer grid cell to which we apply the gravity model, uh, which means how the populations would shift as a consequence of uh, the kind of data inputs we have driven by climate and the factors that we talked about the demographic changes between 2020 to 2050 uh, from the gridded population of the world. Uh, and we look at, net, at the climate impacts themselves. And we run that at the 14 kilometer grid cell. We then use that to a, a counterfactual where we do not have the inputs of the climate factors going into the demographic model. And that differential then really gives you the shift in the population as a consequence of the climate factors. The 14 kilometer grid cells are then aggregated upwards to the national and regional level. In the original groundswell report, uh, I might add that we worked on three regions. We worked in Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. Within each of these regions, we also looked at a sub-regional level. In Africa, we looked at East Africa region. In Latin America, we looked at Central America and Mexico. Uh, in South Asia, we kept things to the entirety. But to really contextualize the results, 
we then zoomed in on three case studies, one in each region, in each region Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and Mexico. And uh, so we'll come back to the models a bit more. But what I'm going to now describe to you is the expansions we have done or the enhancements we have done to this novel and pioneering scenario-based modeling um, uh, in the work that we've been doing in the last 18 months. Uh, to the three, the first difference was through the three scenarios, we added what we call the fourth scenario, which is the optimistic scenario. This is assuming that we get to the Paris Agreement and also have equitable development. And in terms of the modeling, we had a few additional uh, dimensions. Um, we added on top of the water stress and crop productivity uh, changes, we added what we call the net primary productivity. This is where we have biome level uh, changes in the ecosystem uh, that would be really important. And the reason we did this as well is one is that the ISIMIT models are now available for the net primary productivity, so we added that. But we were doing these enhancements in the context of two pieces of geography. The first is in the Lake Victoria Basin countries, the five countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. In the first report, we had recognized that the Lake Victoria Basin was a hotspot, and we wanted to zoom in and do additional analysis that could really inform policymakers. The second was in the West Africa coastal areas, where we also have a huge investment working with the coastal countries in West Africa. So to take it down to a more granular level, we have added more layers. So we brought in the net primary productivity. We have modeling now instead of 10 year intervals at five year intervals, but we also brought in other non-climate factors, which is the age and sex ratio. We brought in the conflict layer and I'll come back to that. I know you have a particular interest on that and flood risk also from the ISMIT modeling. So what you see in this table are what we call the coefficients, which were then derived based on the calibration, looking back from 1990 to 2000 and then to 2000 to 2010. And the higher the coefficient, that means the bigger it has an influence on the mobility within the, uh, gra within the gravity model that is the basis. Uh, as I mentioned, then we add the sea level uh, rise and the storm surge increment uh, on top of sort of taking areas out where people could be actually present. Uh, in terms of conflict, which is a new aspect we also added in the enhancement, we brought in the ACLED data, uh, which is a fatalities location led. Um, and we did uh, with the modelers, obviously, a spatial crigling. This is an interpolation where we use conflicts in any two points within a one kilometer pixel and even it out in terms of the kind of conflict related fatalities. And this is then fed, fed into the same gravity model. And what you have here is that uh, you can see the coefficients uh, in all cases are different in urban and rural areas because of the characteristics of those. Uh, certainly water stress has a bigger impact, for example, in, in the rural, uh, should be the other way around. Uh, in, the, in the rural areas, obviously, because of agriculture. But you can see in terms of conflict, it has a dampening effect on the population, it begins to make areas less attractive uh, and more so in, in the urban areas. So this is also factored into the model. So uh, very quickly then, what do we learn? And you can see here the results from Groundswell 1 at the bottom and Groundswell 2 on the top. Uh, the higher level of granularity uh, while it provides different kinds of intervening opportunities, recognize that we did a 14 kilometer modeling in the first round. In the enhancements, we did the modeling at one kilometer grid cell, but we did aggregate it back to 14 kilometers before taking it up. Um, so it provides different kinds of intervening opportunities together with the median uh, age uh, aspects as well as the sex ratio aspects. But the patterns remain the same. Uh, the, around the Lake Victoria, we continue to have what we call the climate in migration uh, factors. That means people will tend to move towards those areas and clearly moving away from other areas, particularly uh, around the coast. And so this is an affirmation and a reinforcement of the patterns of movement, uh, even at the two levels of, of, of modeling that we did. Uh, and now this greater granularity uh, does in essence uh, provide us a better basis to have a dialogue. So here you have the results for Tanzania, and you can see the two panels. I'm only presenting um, 
the hotspots, there are numbers in Tanzania, you could have at least up to about 10% of the population, uh, you know, moving as a consequence of climate change, internal climate migration by 2050, and very strong pronouncements of in migration around Lake Victoria movement away from the coast. But I think what, what it has important is that when we look and map it against the poverty map of the country, which is the bottom, you will see that some of the areas of movement, particularly around Lake Victoria, which will become an attractive force, are the areas of highest poverty incidence. Uh, and this really then puts us into convergence of where certain patterns and trends are coming together. And what is it that we can do in an anticipatory manner to look at the issues we talk often about how do we manage those issues in an inclusive development way? What are the adapting place options we can have? Where is it that we may need to facilitate some level of mobility if, if it's not possible for people to stay there? That may happen in the coastal areas, but on the other hand, through anticipatory planning and through the kind, right kind of interventions, you could also strengthen those areas and increase their resilience uh, whether it's by gray or green, uh, green infrastructure, but also the kind of modalities. But there may be need to, for people to be relocated, but it gives you an anticipation of those factors. And ultimately, when people do move, what is it that we can do in the host migrant relationships to increase the social cohesion and reduce tensions? So we, we feel really comfortable with the expansions and the enhancements and the kind of insights that we are getting uh, and we've been having consultations and will continue to do so to better inform policymakers in that anticipatory way. So let me end here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for, for this uh, and all of you. Look forward to the discussion and also the shared learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Kanta, for presenting us, us the um, Groundswell uh, model. And um, I think we will have um, time to discuss on this um, a little later, um, I would now um, like to hand over um, to Pablo, who will um, present um, his work and the IDMC um, work. And um, I think um, it fits quite well also to um, the, the work of the Groundswell report. Um, and then later on, we will come to the more AI driven um, instruments um, that will be presented by the other panelists. Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Katrin. Right? Yeah, okay, perfect. Uh... Okay, yeah, first of all, uh, on behalf of, uh, of IDMC, um, we would like to thank you for the invitation to participate in this lecture series. Actually, for us, it is an honor and, and we are very happy to participate here today as this kind of, of event is one of the pillars of our mission, you know, to, to galvanize action, create new spaces for discussion and debate around internal displacement. And uh, also I, I wanted to, uh, to note that uh, today at uh, 2 p.m. after this, this uh, event, we are presenting uh, our annual global report on internal displacement uh, that is already on our website. And uh, this year it focuses on, on climate change. I share the link in the, in the chat uh, together with another link that I will tell you later. So uh, basically um, internal displacement associated with climate change or a slow onset environmental change and disasters are still a complex and, and dynamic phenomenon, right? Um, often it's hard to distinguish uh, from internal migration, um, but displacement driven by gradu gradually um, evolving environmental change, we think is primary a uh, development issue because a sustainable economic growth and development practices accelerate climate change and also environmental degradation, which in turn may reduce crop yields and access to natural resources and eventually force people from their land and communities. Um, I wanted to start, um, I can change my in the slide, yeah, uh, with, you know, what we know right now, um, because there is a growing body of knowledge about how dynamics of human mobility develop in the context of slow onset hazards um, processes. And uh, also uh, because distinguishing between forced and voluntary movements in a slow onset hazard context is difficult yet critical in its implications for policy, mostly. Uh, whereas the decision to move um, 
in order to counter the challenges faced by the impacts of climate change can be an opportunity and a positive of option with the possibility of return, being forced to move against one's uh, will usually has many negative consequences, including the loss of uh, assets, community cohesion, and access to, to services. So with our, our partners and, and different partners, not only national, but also uh, globally, we thought uh, that uh, these are the you know, four main ways in which forced displacement in a slow onset context comes about. First of all, slow onset events can erode the capacity of ecosystems to provide critical services, such as the ability, availability of fresh water. And also, these events may turn to a disaster prompted by a rapid onset event. Um, also, climate change may erode a community, you know, just the impacts of a slow and rapid onset events. Um, trigger a cascade of hazards uh, prompting displacement. And the last one is that these events are hidden aggravating factor, a hidden aggravating factor in many contexts as a threat multiplier for other drivers of, of crisis. So basically uh, what we are doing is that uh, we are marking on a, a research agenda by applying an internal displacement risk lens you know, to existing evidence. And we also conducted and we are conducting new analysis on policy options for countries that face large scale in internal, internal displacement. So the main question to answer is how can governments and their partners manage and reduce displacement risk in a slow onset disaster context? And uh, I think it's important to identify three key objectives. Uh, to better understand the risk conditions in different slow onset contexts, scale and impact of displacement and levels of displacement risk and basically and most important to identify these policies you know policies and practice forward look and sustainable approaches to reduce internal displacement in each situation so through this um, you know research program and our monitoring efforts efforts we have conducted uh, in recent years different case studies, mostly in, in Ethiopia and, and Somalia, about drought-induced drought displacement. Um, with it, we need to systematically analyze how displacement associated with environmental degradation and climate change comes about, and how slow onset events determine displacement risk. So um, we think that the um, knowledge gaps right now are through uh, or we can analyze through these three areas. First of all, unpacking the role of slow onset events in trigger displacement. Second, understanding the potential scale of displacement. And finally, analyzing displacement risk and policy responses. So how we are doing or doing this? Uh, first of all, or a first step um, in addressing um, internal displacement in the context of climate change is understanding better how it comes about. So with this in mind, we uh, have been developing a typology of such displacement events. That is a framework that we are going to publish in the following, I think in the next month, probably next month or in a couple of months. So this typology is a, a typology of displacement events in the context of climate change, you know, a framework that enables the in-depth analysis as well as the identification of options to prevent and respond in a more systematic manner. So this report is like an introduction to this, uh, to this framework. And you know, um, here we analyze that slow onset disasters combine with socioeconomic and governance factors to set the stage for specific triggers of displacement that includes loss of land, loss of livelihoods, food or water, um, insecurity, and also sudden onset disasters uh, that may be more frequent and intense by, by climate change. So each combination of drivers, triggers, and impacts creates a specific displacement situation uh, for which tailored measures can, can be taken. Basically, this is one of the first um, tools that we are analyzing um, right now. You know, um, basically, uh, because we have evidence uh, already in different countries uh, around the world. Based on the typology, 
uh, is the second point, displacement risk assessments. We are conducting risk assessments in countries that illustrate each type of situation using uh, deterministic, statistical, and uh, probabilistic risk assessments. So the first step is to identify relevant risk metrics for each situation, um, you know, that advocate for optional level policy development and investment planning, and also local level programming and implementation. That local level is key, it's really, really important. So uh, starting with one or two types of situation, the second step will be to conduct granular risk assessments uh, in partnership with local authorities. We are more or less in that point in, in Ethiopia and, and Somalia. Then we have the analysis of displacement risk and policy options, because for each type of displacement context, we uh, are undertaking local research combining quantitative, but, but, but most important qualitative methods, you know? Here we want to unpack, uh, or we are unpacking displacement dynamics, behavioral patterns, the enabled environment uh, in terms of socioeconomic conditions and institutional frameworks. And finally, and I share with you um, the second link in the, in the chat, it's about the model system dynamics and policy outcomes that we are developing around drug displacement particularly. So based on system dynamics and agent-based uh, modeling approaches, we are mapping the ways in which policy responses and long-term investments determine displacement risk more systematically and to understand under what uh, circumstances this displacement will, will um, likely occur and what the type importance uh, will be. So um, we, we will have um, results from Ethiopia, you know, uh, through the system dynamics and, and, and the relationship with uh, drug displacement. Um, so yeah, uh, basically, I, this is what I wanted to present. Um, one important thing is that uh, for anything you need or the participant need, uh, here is my, my email in, in red. So that's why I put it in red. Uh, you can, if you want to write me, uh, yes, I will be happy to, to help you to support. And yeah, happy to answer any question. If I don't have the answer at the moment, uh, I will come back to you by, by email. So yeah, thank you very much again. Thank you very much, um, Pablo, for presenting the work and approaches of the IDMC. Um, I would just like to um, to ask the audience or um, let the audience know once again that um, you um, may post um, questions in the chat already, um, if you like, on the go, um, so we can collect the questions um, after the presentations. Please feel free to post your questions in the chat already. And um, for now, I would like to hand over um, to Diana now, who um, will present um, the work of herself and her team. Um, and um, it is, um, as you will see, more based on artificial intelligence um, than the other approaches that were presented earlier. Uh, Diana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Katrin. Uh, so first of all, of course, I would like to thank you for this invitation and it's an honor for our team and myself to be a part of this uh, workshop or webinar uh, to discuss the importance of the uh, climate change and how it actually affects the uh, movements of displacement. So uh, I'm a uh, research fellow uh, in multi-scale migration prediction in the Department of Computer Science at Brunel University of London. Uh, I'm working along with uh, Derek Haroon, Hamid Imran, and Dalila Reza Jahani, who is also present today here. Uh, and we focus on uh, predicting forced migration, focusing on the conflict-induced movements. Uh, but today, of course, we'll be focusing on the, uh, on the topic of simulating refugee movements and the promise of AI. So to start with, um, Can you see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, currently, as you know, there are more than 80 million forcibly displaced people worldwide, of which 26 million are refugees and uh, 40, almost 46 million are internally displaced people worldwide. 
So uh, it's difficult to foresee and accurately forecast how forced migration trends uh, emerge or how they actually evolve over the time uh, due to the severity and the instability of uh, conflicts or crisis that happens in these countries. However, it is possible to capture relevant aspects of this complex phenomenon and propose an approach forecasting future migration trends. Hence, we in our team developed a simulation development approach that focuses on uh, simulating and predicting distribution of incoming refugees from a conflict origin to a neighboring countries. So our main aim within this uh, project uh, or within this work is to save refugee lives as it helps governments and NGOs to allocate humanitarian resources efficiently to refugee camps or to our countries that actually facing this displacement. Uh, also to complete incomplete data collection of refugee movements. Main uh, issue that we faced when we started uh, working on this topic is that there are lots of incomplete data that exists in relation to the forced migration displacement. Uh, and third aspect is to investigate the consequences of a nation that closes its borders for refugees or when there's a camp uh, closures or this, uh, uh, forced displacement of refugees from one camp to another. So we tried to identify, and this, these three objectives were main motivation that drove us to continue this work within the forced displacement. So to provide more details about what is our simulation development approach and how we do it. So we select the country and the period uh, for which we're going to uh, simulate our or model our uh, uh, model. and. Uh, after taking that country and the period that we want to focus on, we uh, obtain data to that particular conflict. We obtain data from three main, uh, four main uh, data sources. So one of them in more detail where is the NHCI data repository that identifies the force refugee counts as well as the camp locations. So taking from the UHCR website, we're able to allocate where the camp locations are that makes the people to go to those camps and what's the total number of the refugee numbers or first displaced within that country. The next data source that we use is the ACLET. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with it. It's a conflict, uh, armed conflict location event data project that identifies the conflict locations. And we also use, uh, like Kanta mentioned, with the fatality rates. Uh, and then another data source that we have is OpenStreetMap. So what we do is after identifying the camp locations and the conflict zones, we try to connect these locations together to identify a network map, agent-based network map that our uh, agents or refugees uh, move along from the conflict zones towards the camps. After identifying these routes, locations, what we do is that we refine our model by adding additional information such as border, border closures, camp closures, population of the car, uh, cities, as well as main major towns. And then we also go through uh, different reports to identify different types of forced directions that happen within the uh, neighboring countries that uh, forced displaced our arrive to. And the uh, next step within our simulation is uh, executing our model. We use flea code. Flea code is a um, uh, agent-based simulation code that is developed uh, in-house in our department. Uh, the initial uh, start was by Derek Harun, uh, and uh, it was used, and it is used currently as well for simulating movements of individuals across geographic locations. So, uh, and it's also optimized for simplicity and flexibility. Uh, what I mean by that is that we try to uh, model individual agents as refugees, and we try to keep it as simple as possible, considering all the factors and how they behave within the environment where the conflict happens and how they actually arrive to the neighboring countries. Uh, Flea code is available. It is uh, open source, and uh, it's released under the BSD3 closed license. You can actually uh, take a look at the uh, GitHub account here if you want to try the Flea code. Uh, so after executing our model, we get our results, and we've done so far uh, for countries such as Mali, Central African Republic, South Sudan, and Burundi. And latest, one of the, one of the uh, countries that we have looked at is the Ethiopia. 
as I said, we our uh, simulations mainly focused as the conflict based, uh, but we also like to, uh, and we are trying to include other aspects such as floods, uh, food security, and weather, of course. Um, so far, we validated our approach against the refugee registration from the UNHCR data. So within the camp locations, we're also able to identify how many refugees arrived to those camps in neighboring countries. And we validated our results uh, compared against them. And we're able to achieve 75% of accuracy when we validate to the, uh, against this historical data. We have uh, collaborative work with uh, UNHCR, Save the Children, and IOM. Uh, and then the last, uh, another aspect that I want to touch upon is the Ethiopia conflict. So within Ethiopia conflict, it's, as you know, it's flared up in November in 2020. And uh, Save the Children actually requested us to model this recent event and try to uh, model and predict or forecast the future movements that might happen uh, in the coming months. So what we did is we included internal displacement as well as refugees within the within Ethiopia and to try to model how these uh, people arrived to Sudan. And uh, we also forecasted our model using uh, different scenarios and we tried to randomize how conflicts erupt in different locations and how this affect the movements. And we're able to uh, identify that it's not about the uh, intensity of the conflict uh, that actually drives the displacement or the refugees. The main is the where these conflicts happen in order to uh, move these uh, displaced people to a, a safer places. As you can see in the graphs on the right, we have Hamdayet camp, which is uh, a main point entry point for Ethiopian refugees. And they, uh, you can see there's 100 uh, runs that we've done. And the black line shows the UNHCR data, while the uh, blue line shows our simulation results. So uh, next, uh, we'll talk about how we actually incorporate uh, in our model uh, weather data. So Ali Reza is my colleague uh, who will continue yeah. on this. Hello, everyone. Uh, I will continue the presentation. And as uh, Diana mentioned, uh, we are modeling uh, the conflict-induced uh, scenarios. So. Uh, in this uh, scenario, uh, which uh, might help you to understand uh, how we uh, couple our model with um, the climate data and uh, how we can use uh, different data sets for uh, weather conditions and um, couple it with our model uh, in order to achieve better results in our simulation, I will uh, introduce you with uh, the South Sudan conflict and uh, we model it with a multi-scale simulation. Uh, we divided the South Sudan conflict at, and, the, and the location graph into different uh, two regions. Uh, one is a micro, uh, which uh, includes three eastern provinces of Upper Nile, Gambala, and Jungle, and the rest of uh, South Sudan as a macro model. Uh, we also obtained weather data from ECMWF uh, while uh, the API, as you see here. Uh, after pre-processing uh, our data, and uh, just as usual uh, of uh, our simulations, uh, in the micro-scale model, uh, which uh, consider uh, the model in more detail uh, rather than the macro model, uh, we incorporate two different data sets uh, uh, in terms of uh, climate. Uh, one is for participation level of uh, the studied uh, region in the micro level, and also the river discharge uh, for the studying uh, for studying the chance of floods uh, in that region. So. After coupling uh, these data sets into our model, uh, we uh, achieve our results uh, for the micro model and couple uh, with uh, weather data. So, uh, Diana, would you go? Yes, thank you so much. So, uh, in terms of uh, precipitation level, uh, we uh, collected the data for 40 years to identify the total precipitation level and uh, 
we use these uh, data to uh, achieve uh, a new data sets for uh, each locations in the micro model and uh, finding the threshold uh, for the um, acceptable, uh, uh, how can I say, acceptable uh, precipitation level for refugees that they can uh, uh, go and uh, flee from the conflict region. So, uh, for instance, if we have very, very high precipitation level, uh, we change the uh, distance uh, to their destination and increasing it. And uh, if they uh, weren't any uh, specific uh, precipitation level in that uh, time, uh, we didn't uh, change their distance so they can uh, use the normal uh, way and continue their fleet to the destination, to the destination camps. So uh, as you see, the movement speed calculation uh, followed by uh, three conditions. So if uh, the pre total precipitation uh, is below the uh, first threshold, uh, uh, the speed will not change or the in better uh, uh, word, uh, the distance uh, would not change. If the total precipitation is above the second threshold, the link uh, we will consider closed. And uh, in the between of these uh, two thresholds, uh, we just double the root uh, distance. So uh, that was for a precipitation level. Uh, for a river discharge, uh, we uh, collected it by a global for, uh, uh, forecasting system to explore the threshold for the routes. And since uh, in the micro uh, model uh, in South Sudan, we have a lot of rivers, uh, we uh, collected these data to find about uh, the daily uh, river discharge in terms of uh, uh, refugees way to their uh, destination camps. and. Uh, we just use a very, very simple rule uh, with one threshold to define the river distance. And if the river discharge at uh, the midpoint of the way to the uh, destination, I mean the midpoint uh, because uh, we have uh, the conflict area that uh, refugees want to flee from there and the uh, camp. So, we just uh, calculated the midpoint between uh, these two locations. And for that midpoint, if the river discharge was more than uh, 8,960 uh, kilometer uh, per square, uh, the link will be uh, closed. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, if you have any questions or any uh, more details you'd like to know about how we yeah. work in relation and how we're progressing, please get in touch. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Um, and um, yes, uh, thank you so much for presenting um, your work. And um, Daniel, um, just um, for your information, Daniel posted a couple of links already in the chat. Um, so for everyone, please check the chat and um, and feel free to, to use the links and um, um, find more information about the presentations um, in these uh, links. And of course, please feel free to post uh, your questions. Um, but um, last but not least, I will um, now hand over to Alex Alexander and ask you to present um, your work that you are doing for the um, Danish Re um, DRC and um, I am looking very forward um, to um, listen to this because um, I think um, you definitely are the one person who um, works very closely at the link between um, science and um, humanitarian practice. Um, so yes, please the floor is yours. Thank you very much and, and thank you also for, for the opportunity to, to speak today. Uh, you're absolutely right that, that I at least uh, try to work in, in, the, in the space between uh, science and, and, and practice and I come more from the practitioner side today. So, so all the tough questions on uh, models and so on, 
I will probably not be able to answer in very much detail because I have our, our data scientists to support me there. Uh, but I'll present a little bit today on, on this foresight tool that, that we have developed to, to help and inform the, our work on the ground. Uh, the Danish Refugee Council works in, in more than 40 uh, countries around the world where we support uh, refugees and displaced uh, populations. And what we've seen too often in our work is that, that despite good intentions and good analysis, we, we often fail to foresee and plan for what, what will come uh, next year. Uh, we saw it with the so-called refugee crisis in Europe. We saw it in the Rohingya crisis in 2017. Um, and, and that is sort of despite the fact that we feel that actually there is quite a lot of data out there in, in the humanitarian sector that we should be able to use and analyze to be better, be better at foreseeing uh, the, what will happen in the future. Um, so what we uh, set out to do three years ago uh, was to explore what is the potential of using predictive analytics in the, in the humanitarian sector. Uh, and we entered into a partnership with, uh, with IBM uh, and received funding from the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs to, to explore this. And um, what we set out to do was to see if we could build a model that could uh, forecast forced displacement uh, one to three years into the future. And when I say forced displacement, I am talking about IDPs, uh, as well as refugees and asylum seekers. So not distinguishing between whether people cross borders uh, or not. Uh, and the vision was really if we could build this model that we could, that would inform our sort of annual strategic planning cycle, but potentially also be able to inform the sort of wider strategic, uh, strategic planning in the wider humanitarian sector. Um, so initially what we did was to, to build a framework on, um, on sort of what, what drives displacement. And we are essentially looking at the sort of macro level root causes of displacement. So we're of course looking at violence, uh, we're looking at governance aspects, uh, we're looking at the economy and population, but of course also including uh, environment in our model. So we look at disasters, we look at uh, pollution, we look at water, we got food security, agricultural stress, and these, these type of aspects. Um, and we used more than 120 different indicators uh, in our model to measure all these uh, different dimensions. And basically what we have done is then we've taken uh, on these 120 different indicators, we've taken 25 years of historical data. It's all drawn from open sources. So we also use Eclat like uh, many others here as well. Uh, also couple that with the Uppsala conflict data, uh, a lot of uh, World Bank development indicators, um, and then also data from, from different UN agencies and different NGOs is, is included in the model. We then, as I mentioned, train, train this uh, machine learning model on these 25 years of historical data to, uh, so the model can sort of learn and understand the the patterns and relationships. And we work essentially with, with two models. So one is uh, this sort of uh, point forecast model. So that can give us a specific number of what will the stock of displaced people be uh, next year and three years into the future. Uh, the other model we are working with is a so-called network, Bayesian network model, which looks at a subset of 15 key drivers uh, of displacement and how they interrelate and in turn drive displacement uh, risks. And both of these models are then uh, are available in an online user interface where uh, uh, we provide access to users that can go and they can access the model, see the forecast, they can build their own scenarios and see how that changes the forecast. Um, and they can also access all the underlying data. Uh, I'll give a bit more information on these, these elements in, in the presentation. Um, but first on, on the results from, from this exercise. So we initially tested it in Afghanistan and Myanmar and, and thought it showed quite encouraging results. So what I'm showing you here, the red dots are the actual displacement stock that here and the green squares or diamonds were the predictions our model made. So essentially we trained the model on data up until 2009 and then asked it to predict 2010 
obviously we know uh, how many people were displaced in 2010, so we can calculate the margin of error in the, in the forecast. And if we take the average across these, all these different years from 2010, we get an average margin of error of 8% in the case of Afghanistan and around 10% in uh, the case of Myanmar. Uh, and, and we feel that sort of, that, that is sort of a fairly good starting point for predictions and a fairly low sort of uh, margin on error, margin of error on, on average. But we can also see some, some clear limitations in this approach and, uh, and the model we have developed. And one is, of course, it, it goes to, to the sort of the methodology that when you build on these historical data and relationships, the, the models tend to have a hard time predicting unprecedented events. Uh, so as you see the Rohingya crisis in 2017, our model didn't predict that that uh, there would be that sudden surge in, in displacement, again, because nothing like that had ever happened in the history of, uh, of Myanmar. The other uh, challenge, which also partly explained why we, we didn't forecast the Rohingya crisis, is that we build our model on national level data, so it tends to um, perform better when displacement situ situations affect larger parts of the country. So in the case of Myanmar, again, when we look at our national level data, um, a lot of things were going great in Myanmar, seen from a national level perspective. Um, governance were improving, democracy was, was improving and so on. But of course, the situation in the Rakhine state was very different from the national level, but that didn't sort of really translate into the national level data that we're looking at. So that's some of the, the limitations that we are, that we're working with. Um, and then again, is eight, 10 percent good or bad? That I, depends on, on what you compare to. And uh, what we've done is that we have tried to compare to what else is now being used in the humanitarian system. And of course, as you may know, uh, sort of the main strategic planning tool in the sector is are the humanitarian response plans, which are developed each year for each humanitarian crisis. Uh, and in those plans, you have planning figures for how many will you need to respond to. Um, and we then analyze how accurate were those planning figures actually to what, what then happened uh, and how do they compare to our the, the predictions our model is. Because now we have applied the the model across uh, 20 different countries. And as you can see here, there are four countries where the humanitarian response plans perform better. That's Somalia, Chad, Libya, and Venezuela. But in the other countries where we can compare, uh, our model is more accurate. So we, we feel that this model can actually add value to the so more uh, strategic planning in, in the humanitarian sector and are also engaging now with, with OCHA on potentially uh, using it. Um, but one of the conclusions we've also drawn because of the limitations we're seeing, uh, the way that we encourage uh, our organization to use it and external users as well, is to, well, the baseline forecast is a fairly good starting point, but you should also factor in your own assessment and analysis of the situation and use the model for more sort of scenario-based forecasts. And to support that exercise, we develop this Bayesian network model that builds on data from 28 countries that all have a history of displacement. And essentially look at what are the relationships between these different key drivers of displacement and how they relate to displacement risk. Because for example, violence, we know violence drives displacement directly, but violence also impacts on the human rights situation and the impacts on the economic situation in the country and so on, which in turn also impact on the displacement situation. So it's really to help the users understand this network. And of course, in this network, we also have aspects related to uh, climate uh, and the environment to really uh, understand a little bit how, how, that, how those links uh, work. Um, and, and essentially what you can do is that you can tweak these different parameters and see, well, if we have an increase in, for example, natural disasters, how will that change the risk of displacement? But also how will it change the risk of conflict of a poor human rights situation and all these other aspects in, in the network. So that's sort of a little bit how we can, we can use that. Uh, and we can, of course, we are continuously refining this also with the parameters that we put in. And I think especially actually 
on environment and climate, our the, the data we have isn't maybe the or the best indicators we have so now in the model. So there's still some some work to do here. Um, and just to to round it off the presentation to also open up for, for questions, just a few examples of how we've used it again coming from law of the the practitioner side of things. Uh, what we have used it for uh, the model we built was finished around uh, so last year. Of course, there's still work to do. Uh, we've used it to inform our sort of annual strategic planning cycle. Each year, we we do our own strategic planning where we look at the context and make scenarios for for the coming year, including what is the potential sort of caseload of the related to displacement. So that so we've used that in particularly in, in West Africa. What we've also done is to use it for to understand what is the impact of sudden onset crisis on displacement. So we, for example, analyzed how would uh, COVID-19 potentially impact on displacement risk and displacement forecast focusing on uh, the Sahel region. Uh, we've also done scenarios looking at, for example, what would happen if uh, ISIS reemerge in Syria or US troops uh, withdraw. Um, and, and you could make similar forecasts, for example, related to how will the coup in Myanmar potentially affect uh, displacement forecast in, in the country and, and so on. We've actually also done some scenarios related to drought in Afghanistan uh, for this year and how that potentially could drive uh, increased displacement in the country. Uh, and then we can also use it for these more hypothetic displacement scenarios uh, where we, for example, looked at um, how will uh, climate change uh, uh, potentially increase or change the displacement risk scenarios in, in the countries of uh, Myanmar and Afghanistan? And generally, we are working quite a lot to, to better understand and, and try to model the, the, the link between climate change, environmental degradation, uh, and, and displacement. And they've collaborated also with, with IDMC on the the systems uh, modeling approach that uh, the Pablo also uh, presented earlier. Um, so I think I will I will stop there again. As as others have mentioned, if you have any uh, questions or comments, look forward to it. But also, if you're interested in collaborating or accessing the online platform, you're more than welcome to to reach out. Uh, I will also leave my email in the in the chat, so so you can can easily get a hold of me. So I think I will uh, I will stop there. But thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alexander, for presenting your work and in particular also um, for presenting the user examples um, at the end, because I, I find it um, very helpful also to think um, in this way and um, it helps me really to, um, yeah, to get a concrete idea of how to use um, this data in humanitarian practice. Um, yes, I would like to open um, the discussion now and um, I can see that we received one question in the chat. Um, I have also prepared a number of questions and um, I suggest that I, um, to kind of kick off um, the discussion, I will pose a couple of um, questions, also including the um, question here from the chat and um, give you some time to, to answer it. Um, I decided to um, pose a couple of questions, so you may just pick um, whatever you would like to answer. You, of course, you don't have to um, answer all of this. Um, you will see from the amount of questions um, I have that my team and myself, we, we really um, have a lot of questions. Um, and I still hope that there will be also questions um, from the audience. So I thought, um, first of all, um, maybe I ask um, a couple of questions um, to Kanta and um, Pablo. And um, um, for me, um, one important um, question would be if you see any um, concrete knowledge gaps or blind spots um, in, in your models and um, what do you think, what uh, data would be needed maybe to improve the accuracy um, of um, your, your models. And um, another question I have is, um, um, why actually um, both of you um, are focusing only on internal um, displacement and um, if it would make um, sense also to uh, to include um, at least um, as a um, prospect um, also cross-border um, displacement. Um, 
And then um, I, I could add the questions um, from the chat. And um, here is the question, um, what are the advantages or disadvantages that you identify with regards to predictive modeling and classic scenario planning techniques? And, and then also a question with respect to the users um, beyond advocacy that you were mentioning um, also in your presentation, um, advocacy for more inclusive development and climate action can humanitarian organizations also benefit from, um, from these models and from your work and if so, how? Um, I don't know who would like to go first and as i said um, of course no need to answer all these questions um, just take it as a stimulation for further diving into the topic i can start thank you catherine for those questions but i also want to thank um, the other presenters i mean it's a really uh, interesting set of presentations and um, coming into the issue from different perspectives is really Mine always sort of makes connections of how these different approaches uh, help us to really understand the issue better. But a little bit to your questions, um, in terms of the modeling itself, are there any gaps? Um, you know, I think the model is obviously based on inputs and, and then you get certain sort of outputs out of it. Uh, and it's a, going to be always a continuing, continuous process of enhancement. I think what we try to do is even as one enhances the models and brings in more dimensions like we did in this round, bringing in the flood risk, bringing in the conflicts. I think what is um, really useful is I think when we do the calibration and of the models, the valid, you know, the, the autoregressive uh, spatial uh, uh, calibration, I think the more data we can put in, the more sort of you know ground truth events and data that goes into that and the, 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 the signals, uh, capturing the signal will always be important. Remember that we are looking in for climate signals uh, from 1990 to 2000, 2000 to 2010. And even as we are doing that, we know that the climate signal itself is getting stronger even now as, as we sort of intensify. So it's going to be a process of, 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 of always staying on top of that. But I think really the ground truthing part is very important. And we really do actually, in fact, with the Danish Refugee Council, there's some work that's involved with the African Union and, and UNDP and other partners, where the focus group interviews and the validation becomes really important in terms of how these models uh, tell the story. Uh, the models are the big picture and help planners. But I liked also uh, the question that was online, um, and I'll come to your question, Catherine, about whether these kind of models and predictions um, bias decision makers uh, into how we look at the issue. And I think that's a very pertinent question. Uh, and it's important how we present our findings and contextualize it and put it in the right framing because the numbers or the, the issues are not supposed to magnify or to bias things, but to help us to better understand the issues. From our perspective, from the World Bank, we were interested in these bigger patterns and trends. We know that we are locked into a certain amount of warming with regard to climate change. We know that these impacts are unfolding. We know from the evidence and, and what we see real time people are being displaced and people are being, their livelihoods are being impacted. And while we want to focus on our current uh, practices, we know that without looking at the horizon, we would be missing opportunities for a different approach uh, in terms of planning, in terms of the dialogue, in terms of territorial approaches, uh, in terms of uh, strengthening our frontliners uh, in, in, in these localities we'll have to, who will have to deal with these issues but also informing policy makers uh, because migration, displacement, whatever you call it, is very cross-cutting and it's not falling in any one neat department of the policy uh, context within countries. Um, lastly, I just want to say, why did we focus on internal? I think from a development perspective, we were looking at the context in which we work um, the underlying factors that we can sort of address more systematically 
uh, to avert or to minimize the distress-driven uh, mobility patterns. But also, I think we started from the global understanding that a lot of that movement actually happens within countries and within countries and within regions. Lastly, on the point about why didn't we do cross-border in the modeling exercise, uh, the model will land itself to it, but I think it will, we will have to um, bring in a lot more dimensions about border controls and like I think uh, Diana's presentation and others should, which would complicate it, but then the permutations become quite unmanageable. So we think it's important to, to consider it, but perhaps not to model it. Uh, so just maybe want to put that on the table. Thank you very much. I just maybe said a lot, but I wanted to touch on those issues that were fresh in my yeah, mind. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Kanta. And then I hand over to Pablo, who might also have some answers to these questions. Yeah, thank you, Katrin. Uh, I want to share with you a couple of more links. Uh, the first one is, uh, well, how we analyze, you know, research in, in a, or displacement in a changing climate. Climate, but the other one is uh, internal displacement and the relationship to cross-border displacement that, that that you that you mentioned, right? Um, I mean, uh, why we are as IDMC we focus on internal displacement? It is because it's our mandate uh, by the United Nations, and and also I I think that's the main reason. But also we have this research agenda, you know, to to analyze the relationship between internal displacement and movements of refugees and migrants in, in general, because that relationship, relationship it, it is not uh, well um, understood. And about um, the other two questions, the, the knowledge gaps and, and, and forecasting, um, in, in our opinion, it's very positive to, to divide, and I'm gonna start my screen in a, in a second, right? Uh, to divide, <clears throat> different levels of, of analysis. Uh, for instance, with, with this new methodology uh, for monitoring drought displacement, just drought displacement, we at the first level are collecting, first of all, observational data, you know, on reported number of people displaced by drought combined with qualitative contextual analysis and, you know, personal narratives. This is the first level of monitoring that produce quantitative displacement estimates and uh, supported by you know, minimal verification. Then we have um, another level, and I'm, I'm gonna show you my, my screen because it's easier to, to understand, I think. Um, you can see my screen, right? Yeah, perfect. So in the first level, uh, basically you can see how we are trying to validate the hypothesis about drought displacement, just not uh, a other kind of a slow onset events, just drought displacement in one country, for instance, drought displacement in Ethiopia, right? With the estimations of rainfall, uh, carrying capacity, livestock, livelihoods, IDPs, etc. Then in the second level, it's um, our process, sorry, because of the noise, uh, the process of collection of empirical data. So compare the, the data that we have uh, because of the government or other agencies with empirical data that we can um, we can achieve through our you know field research etc. Et and then we have to create and this is the third level where we are working you know forecasting based on emp empirical uh, data. Uh, these are the three levels of monitoring drug displacement uh, in this case of pastoralists in Ethiopia and, and Somalia. And the idea is that we would like to do the same with other uh, slow onset events like you know, I don't know but sea level rise for instance or the certification etc. And the system dynamics here is, uh, as you can see, how, how it works. And it's a, a combination, you know, of a multicausal nature of pastoralist displacement, because these pastoralists, for instance, in Ethiopia or, or in Somalia, they didn't displace only because of the drought, but they, they mentioned that they displaced because they lost the, the livestock or the, you know, the difficult to access uh, water. So here is this, uh, this system dynamic methodology help us to understand the interconnection between, uh, you know, different uh, causes, different triggers, and um, that finally uh, cause the displacement of uh, pastoralist uh, communities. It is not only climate change impacts, it's also degradation and desertification, the conflict situation, uh, market access, so different, um, different elements to analyze um, basically how drought and conflict displacement dynamics for sedentary farmers and agro-pastoralists displacement in Ethiopia and Somalia 
you know, uh, they finally are displaced and how now the government, UN agencies and NGOs can uh, support them to achieve uh, durable solutions that normally in, in these cases are durable solution. The durable solution is the local integration in, in host communities. So yeah, I think I think this is more or less a, a general idea to, to answer both both questions. But uh, yeah, I mean, happy to, to discuss more, of course. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank, thank you, Pablo. Thank, thank you very much. It, um, it was um, a very interesting answer to the question and um, very concrete. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think we have a couple of more questions in the chat, and I would like to invite Daniel Vella um, to maybe um, read them out to us and um, select um, a couple of the questions that were posed in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Katrin. Um, we have a question for Alexander, and it's uh, he explicitly mentioned the intersection between research and practice. And the question is, how do you ensure the smooth transfer of findings and proper application in humanitarian contexts? What would you generally say are the medium and long term requirements for researchers and practitioners uh, with regard to the development and above all, the application? of these kinds of predictive models uh, we have discussed today. Yes, thank you. I think that's a, that's a very good question and something, of course, we've also been, been grappling uh, with a little bit. I think what, what we've seen, I think, in the humanitarian sector, there's been, there is a lot of work being done on predictive analytics. Uh, a lot of models have been developed, but the examples of these models actually being used and informing action on the ground are still very limited, unfortunately. So it is it is a it is a major challenge still. How do we how do we link these models and research and academia uh, with with the pra practitioners on the ground and and what are the challenges there? I think from from our experience in this project, I think there are some lessons learned that that might be relevant. And I think one of the things that that we have learned is that you can you can model a lot of things and you can develop a lot of interesting models but the starting point for these models really needs to be what is the problem you're trying to solve and who are the user of this model who's going to use it when are they going to use it in, to inform what processes and so on and and then you will of course reach a conclusion also with what type of information do they then need in order to 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 base decisions of, of these models so th that's at least one thing that that needs to that needs to really go into the des design that we really need to start with with the problem and especially the the user uh, in mind um, and and we personally didn't start there we started more oh, this is this is interesting we thought there might be a problem but then we we develop the model and then afterwards started thinking about who the user were and then we, we needed to, to of course adapt that adapt our approach. Then I think that the second thing that, that is helpful is again as you also write in the, the question is that what what do we need? Do we need data scientists uh, in, in the humanitarian sector or, or humanitarian uh, actors with, with a dash of, uh, of, of data science? And I think we probably need a little bit of, of uh, both um, there is still a lot of work to be done in terms of creating data literacy among uh, humanitarian uh, practitioners. And, and this, despite your best efforts of making these models user friendly, it, it will still be numbers and you still need a little bit to, to understand what's behind those numbers uh, because no one's going to take decisions if they don't feel they can trust the, 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 the model or the, the numbers they're getting. And, and that's a big challenge with, with these machine learning models because it's so much a black box. Uh, and uh, who's going to say there will be uh, 2 million more people displaced in, in DR Congo this year, but we don't know why, because the model doesn't tell us. Um, and, and for decision maker, that's not good enough. They would like some explanations for why, these, why the model arrives at these numbers. And that's also one of the reasons why we encourage the, the scenario-based forecast, because then the experts can go in the, with, the, with their knowledge and also have a better feeling about, they, they understand why it's forecasting what it does because they provided the underlying 
qualitative analysis that's informing the, the forecast. Um, so definitely work on on the data literacy side of um, of, uh, of the humanitarian protections, trying to opening up these these models to make it more user friendly, um, and then of course more data scientists uh, in in the organization, more focus on on analysts. We we have nine thousand employees in the Danish Refugee Council, and I think we have one data scientist uh, and more or less one analyst, which is which is myself, and that's not a lot if we want to be an evidence-based uh, and data-driven organization, right? So so still, we need resources in that regard, but yeah, so a little bit of both. Okay, um, thank you, Alexander. Um, and I would like to immediately follow up um, on your question, and but maybe um, pose the question to Diana, um, because um, you were mentioning the difficulty um, in human and humanitarian practice to make use of um, the data and actually my experience when I was dealing with anticipatory humanitarian action that was more focused on um, disaster displacement, um, it turned out that it's quite difficult for, let's say, normal um, humanitarian NGOs um, uh, to, yeah, to really make use of um, these models and um, do their own forecasting and, um, and uh, yeah, include this in early action protocols and, and so on. So um, there seems to be a gap and, and my question um, would be, um, I mean, um, artificial intelligence is a great promise and there are a lot of um, hopes that um, this will solve a number of problems, but um, what are actually from your perspective, Diana, or also Alexander, what are the limits of um, machine learning and are, do you see any alternatives um, to this? And um, also with respect um, to the DRC, I was wondering um, the model and um, I mean the work you are doing, are you doing this um, basically for your own organization or are you kind of planning to scale this up? Will this be usable um, for others? And um, I mean, this is now the question to the DRC, but it would also um, of course be important to ask Diana um, and how far is the work you are doing in the future somehow um, usable for humanitarian organizations and um, it, it's of course also related to this question um, is there the capacity of humanitarian organizations to do this or um, how can science uh, kind of support humanitarian organizations or also development organizations using uh, using these um, data and the, the available um, information. Um, I, I at the moment I see that there um, is a sort of, sort of a gap. And my um, last question um, relates to what you, Alexander, said about the humanitarian response plan and um, where you were kind of comparing um, your results um, with the ones uh, the accuracy of the response plan and I was actually wondering I mean is it really I mean should we wish for more accuracy in this sense or um, would the human I mean the, the humanitarian response plan might also be a political instrument and it's not so helpful um, always to have absolute accuracy in terms of numbers so um, how do you deal with this problem but first of all I um, hand over to Diana now thank you Katrin uh I'm gonna uh, try to uh, provide answer, but Derek and Elisa, please chip in <laughs> also. So to start with, uh, when we started developing uh, our models and run our simulations for different countries, we based them on historical data. As I said in the presentation as well, we faced with different types of uh, data issues because they're incomplete and they're not available by the big organizations as such in HCR. Yes, they do collect and other NGOs, for instance, they also collect data, but they, don't provide it publicly to everyone. Uh, and then when researchers try to uh, predict or make their own models, of course, they face with this issue. However, the main objective that I also explained in presentation, what we're trying to do is help NGOs, as well as other organizations, governments to provide uh, with the um, with the result that we can actually tell, uh, kind of provide to them and then say, okay, uh, this is a conflict that's happening, for instance, and then what can be expected, how many refugees can be ex expected uh, for different uh, camps and how they can efficiently allocate the resources in, this, uh, uh, in these countries. 
uh, but uh, one of the things that we face is that we've uh, collaborated with different uh, organizations uh, within these four or five years. Uh, and uh, we've shared our results, uh, particularly I can tell you the recent one is the Save the Children. So when we started developing the Ethiopia conflict, we've done the forecasting reports that was shared by other NGOs that are uh, on site in uh, Sudan and Ethiopia. Uh, however, uh, they haven't actually directly, how can I say, used our results. Uh, they had discussions with that, how we can improve it, how we can actually make our models better. But there's, as you said, there's a big gap in terms of providing what we have or actually using those uh, evidence that we kind of get from our simulations uh, in hand. And uh, that's a big limitation I see in, uh, in the research as well as in the NGOs communication or collaborations. So um, Derek, can you? Yeah, um, I mean, we also have to be honest to ourselves. The models are not very accurate yet. It's, it's a young field. Many of us have started only perhaps a year, two, three, four, five years ago. Um, and the kind of predictions that are really useful for humanitarian organizations often have to be very specific. So they want to know how many people do arrive in spot A on day, day 20 or something. So a, a general curve about the number of IDPs or refugees over a year only has very limited use because if the organization allocates the resources to the wrong place, then there's a problem. The other th in terms of alternatives to modeling, well, um, there's not, yeah, not, not one type of modeling. And I think also in this uh, session, and my apologies, by the way, for joining late, I had a project meeting that runs at the same time. Um, but there are basically two styles of modeling. The first one is a machine learning based model, um, which I did uh, see at, at the end, uh, where basically you have various characteristics, you gather data, and based on that, you learn and make a forecast for the individual components and then you have an overall forecast, for example, about internal displacements. Um, and our approach is actually quite different from that, because with agent-based modeling, you, you do not train an agent-based model as such. What you rather do is you, it's sort of a store of knowledge about individuals. Um, so, for example, you think, OK, I'm a refugee, I'm in a conflict. What makes me move to another place? Uh, what makes me stay put? Um, when would I be dis uh, displaced? And if I arrive in a camp, uh, under what conditions will I stay there? So the kind of information you feed into an agent-based model is usually local. It's not tr historically trained. Um, and it's very much based on literature, observation, very um, much more qualitative. That has advantages and disadvantages. So if you have something like indeed slow onset migration and you have something that is very much triggered by say climate or other more gradual triggers, then machine learning, in my opinion, is a very good approach because it will take into account all these different elements and it's not particularly hard to do that. If you have a very sudden onset event, like for example, uh, a violent conflict that can by, by its nature uh, evolve in an unpredictable way, um, then agent-based modeling tends to be more suitable because the historical data is, is less useful due to the unpredictable nature. You still want to account for it, but you don't want to train the model using it. And rather you want to see on a more local level, okay, how are, these, how are individuals going to respond given a certain situation and then encode that into the behavior of the individual agents in the simulation. So in short, if something is disruptive and unpredictable, um, it's always hard to forecast it, but I think agent-based models would be more uh, suitable. If something is a bit more slower onset, uh, then machine learning would be much better. The other thing that plays a role is the quality of the data collection. Of course, we all want more and better data, but we have to realize that, uh, especially for forced displacement, these regions are poor, they are in conflict, and very often even humanitarian organizations don't have the resources to help them. So the data collection, is going to be quite flaky in many of these cases for the foreseeable future. And that's another factor where we sometimes may say, okay, machine learning might not work to the standard that we would like. And it could even be so bad that even we start to struggle building the agent-based models as well. Um, and I think these issues explain quite closely along with the simple fact that we all started so recently, uh, why there's still this disconnect between the models being developed and the models being applied by NGOs. 
And it requires a bit of time for us to make more advanced algorithms and to build up trust. And um, I think it is okay that we're not there yet, uh, but we should try to aim for it. Thank you, Derek, for um, this um, intervention. Um, I know our time is um, over now, but I still would like to give um, the last word to Alexander, if you like, and um, please make it short so that we can stop uh, more or less in time. <laughs> I will, I'll be very brief. I can see actually it's half past now. I'll, I'll just try to, uh, to address it quickly, the two questions, uh, which was mainly on to what extent is this available also externally. It was, it was part of the the project and why we see funding was that it shouldn't only inform our own uh, work but also inform the wider humanitarian sector so the platform is open to external users and we also engage with external partners on that are interested in, in collaborating and exploring on the, the model on the the question do we need more accurate uh, hr humanitarian response plans i would say uh, a, a pretty firm yes um, I think what we, we've analyzed the numbers and what we can, for example, see is that in seven, around 70% of the time, they underestimate the, the level of displacement for the coming year. So we are con consistently under prepared for what's, uh, what's coming. And you're absolutely right. It, the reason why the, the inaccurate is because it's very much a political process. Uh, and I recognize that uh, what we hope that we can provide with our model is at least a more sort of objective data-based, uh, data-driven or evidence-based starting point for those discussions so it, it isn't pure politics but there's also a sort of a grain of, of data that can at least maybe sort of fend the of the discussion uh, a little bit so so you stay a little bit closer to, to what uh, what actually happens i'll, I'll stop there <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much to um, everyone for your presentation. I enjoyed very much listening to you and I also enjoyed the discussion. I very much hope that um, we will be able to keep in touch and that you are also interested to keep in touch because um, we are basically starting our work in this field now and um, yeah, try to combine the work we are doing already and um, go deeper into this field so um yeah we hope um, that we can stay in touch and i hope um, also the audience um enjoyed and um yeah I, for now i wish you all a good afternoon and a good day and um hope to see you soon around bye bye <laughs>